My wife forgot she's supposed to do the scripture reading, so <laughs> I will do it. See, that's what good husbands do, right? <laughs> this is from 1 Peter uh, 3, verses 8 through 12. Suffering for doing good. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. I'm glad I got my volume back. Thank you, Derek. This morning, we are back in the letter of 1 Peter. And simply put, we are looking at some instruction on what it means to be a blessing. To be a blessing. And if you look on the screen, you see a representation, a person Jesus Christ hugging a common everyday traveler in life. And um, I love this photo that Beth found. It kind of captures the meaning of what Peter's talking about today. You know, as you look at this fellow, it seems like he really is appreciating what? The love, the kindness, the gentleness, the compassion, the empathy that Jesus Christ is exuding towards him, showing towards him. These are some of the things that Peter talks about in this passage where he talks about be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, be humble, use your tongue for righteousness and blessing and not for ill or deceit. And this is the way the Lord is for us today. And I can imagine, I thought a lot about it this week, I can imagine what the Lord Jesus was like. This is God in the flesh. As he walked and talked with people, as he traveled to very common, dirty villages, as he talked with travelers and families and people, he would often zero in on the one who was designated the worst sinner in town, <laughs> like Zacchaeus, or the leper, or the demon-possessed prostitute. He seemed to gravitate towards these people because they were the most needy. They needed to know that God loved them, cared about them, knew their name. And so this morning, Peter is letting us know, in the same way, all of you be like-minded. You know, he starts the passage that way, here in the NIV. Finally, all of you be like-minded. Like-minded what? Like Jesus Christ. He refers to the example in a paragraph or two before this one where he talks about Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow. So Jesus Christ is our example. Sometimes as we walk as a Christian through this life, we suffer for that, for our faith, for being like him, for pursuing kingdom principles, for, for pursuing righteousness. And here at this place in the letter, Peter is kind of wrapping up a sermon that he's been preaching as I've been rehearsing for weeks. Um, later on next week, he's really going to turn a corner and talk about something else. But this is really the crescendo of what he's been saying these past three chapters. As you know, he's been talking about their identity in Christ. He's been talking about their accountability to live a different life in the face of the world. Then he began to talk about a whole series of ideas and lifestyles of being submissive. He says to be submissive to your ruling governments, your ruling authorities, because this is God's will for you. And that might cause you to feel uncomfortable or suffer. 
He says for you to be submissive to your master. And back in that time, it was slaves and masters. Today, it's employees and employers. And he says to be submissive to them, to be a good ethical worker, even though your boss might be harsh. He's really spelling out how to live the Christian life in our day-to-day -day existence. You know, Christianity isn't some pie-in-the-sky inspirational thing where we have this out-of-body experience and we kind of live in a way that's not relevant to life or to people around us. And I noticed that the Apostle Peter gets really nitty-gritty and practical in Christian living, Christian lifestyle. So he talks about submissiveness. He talks about being very submissive to one another in the husband and wife category, relationship. You know, as I pointed out before, he kind of starts out in society with culture and politics and be submissive. He goes into your work where you spend 50, 60, 70 hours a week. You know, that's where you spend a lot of your time and energy. And how should you behave? Be submissive to your boss, your master, and be a good example to the other workers around you. This is how you impact the world. A lot of people want to be angry and protest and go against the grain to make an impact in the world. Sometimes that helps. As you know, most of the time it doesn't. You can protest until you're blue in the face. Not going to change the law of the land or the governor's perspective. Sometimes the best way we can make an impact is simply going, going into the voting booth. Voting for more godly, wise, common sense individuals to lead our, our state or our nation. But he talks about, he also goes into your home. Now I want to talk to you about your relationship between husband and wife. And he says here, he puts it quite simple and plain, you know, to be submissive, to be gentle, to be considerate, to be kind. For women to be gentle and kind, because this is of great worth in God's sight. Husbands, be considerate. Be very careful, because she is a weaker vessel. Show her great respect so that your prayers aren't hindered. And now today, you know, you know he's talking to? The church. The body of Christ. The people of God as a whole. Because he changes it from individual terminology about servants and slaves, wives and husbands. Now he says, all of you. He's writing this letter to many different churches that he visited. This letter is traveling back now from Rome to Bithynia to Cappadocia to different parts of the Mediterranean where little churches were meeting, out in the courtyard, down by the river, in somebody's home, churches of maybe 50 to 100 people. 100 people was a big church back then. The mega church was in Jerusalem. It was over 2,000 people. Yeah, that was like the modern day equivalency of um, a Willow Creek or something like that. But now he's talking to the church. He ends this sermon by talking to all of you. Verse 8, all of you be like-minded. Like-minded like Christ. Like-minded in submissiveness. He says be sympathetic. So let, let's review the words he's saying. Let, let's, let's flush it out. He says, be sympathetic. What does that mean? Sympathize with the hurts, pains, and burdens of other people. This is a great thing for a Christian to be. A lot of my time and energy is just being a good listener and a good friend and being sympathetic to what people are going through. That's really over half the battle. And it's not just for the pastor. Peter is saying, all of you, brothers and sisters in the church, all of you. I said that all of you were priests. I said that all of you were a holy nation. I said that all of you were precious and chosen by God. I said that all of you were being built up into a spiritual house. And now I'm saying to all of you that you should be like Jesus Christ. You should be a blessing. And how can I be a blessing? By being sympathetic. By showing love to one another. The word love is more than just being friendly. It's being concerned. And as Christians, are we concerned about others? Do we make the effort to have a picnic for our neighbors and let them know that we care about them? Do we show concern like having a cup of coffee with a Christian friend who needs to bend your ear for an hour? Do we show concern by making a call to somebody? Say, hey, you know, I haven't seen you in a couple weeks. Are you okay? 
you know, showing real concern. So it's interesting that the Apostle Peter is giving us very practical, daily advice and counsel about how to be a good Christian. You know, a lot of people seem to wonder, you know, what's it mean to be a good Christian? I need to wear certain kind of clothes, and I need to have a certain kind of haircut, and I need to always be in church on Sunday. Well, those are just the trappings of being maybe a, a nice person. But real Christianity is being like Christ, being willing to suffer for the sake of other people. You know, it says here about Christ, you know, they hurled, verse 23, chapter 2, they hurled insults at him. But he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threat. And so Peter's saying, you know what? You might suffer some insult. You might suffer some hardship. People might not like you. You might lose friends. You might lose family members. They don't like you no more. They don't like to be in the same room with you on the holidays. And Peter's saying, be like Christ. Don't retaliate. Don't breed out threats. Don't be a jerk. No cop an attitude. Well, if you don't like me, then I don't like you. <laughs> you don't go to my holiday party, then I'm not going to yours. That's what we do, right? Well, that ain't being a Christian. And Peter is saying here, love one another, be like-minded, be sympathetic, be compassionate, be humble. All these great words. Humble. The very best biblical definition of humility is, here it is. From, it's from Philippians chapter 2. Again, Paul's talking about the example of Jesus Christ. Humble means I consider others more important and of more value than myself. If you get a hold of that and apply that, that'll change your Christian life and that'll change your relationships. I value you more than I value me. Man, people pick up on that. People just, they love you for it. They appreciate being around you. Uh, you're a blessing to them. Being a blessing. You're being a blessing to them. Like Jesus Christ. See, see God in the flesh, Jesus Christ from all eternity, majesty, eternal king, he had every right to be righteous, self-righteous, and cop attitudes or tell people judgmental statements. He didn't. He was like this. He was looking for the despicable person. Hugging and loving on and befriending the despicable person. This guy looks like he was the rough dude from the neighborhood, right? You know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who were in a religious leadership at the temple, you know what they accused Jesus of? He's a friend of sinners. He eats with prostitutes. He has tax collectors as friends. They said he was a drunkard and a glutton. Why? Because he was at the table with people who were drinking and eating. That's why. And people loved and adored Jesus for it. You know, the people who followed him, they adored him. Why? Because he was like this. He was sympathetic to people's burdens. He loved them deeply from the heart. He had compassion on them, and he was humble. He considered them better than him. So this is some good advice from the Apostle Peter, right, about how to be a Christian and how to make an impact on people. You know, we were circulating with some new people out there yesterday in the beautiful day with the picnic and the games and the food, and I met a couple people from the community, like the firefighters, and I met some uh, women and their children who I'd never met before. And I, I've learned to treat them better than I treat myself. To, to be compassionate. To listen to their long story. To just treat them with a lot of dignity, respect, kindness, and compassion. And in that way, you'd be a blessing. See, because a Christian church, we can ask ourselves, you know, how, how are we going to make an impact? You can have a great calendar plan. You can have a great event out front. You can have a great ministry in-house during the week. But when the people show up, what do they experience? Are you stiff? Are you unfriendly? Are you uncompassionate? 
Are you judgmental? <coughs> oh, well, they don't dress like me. You know, I wear button-down shirts, I've got a nice haircut, I got my act together, but uh, they look kind of messy. No. I was talking to a good brother yesterday, and we were talking about this very thing. And I said, you know what I learned? I learned to look past the hair, <coughs> the tattoos, the clothes, the attitude, the music, the car, the language. I look past all of it. I used to be there. I used to be a dark knight. And I met Jesus. Now I'm a Jedi. And I look past all of that. Because people did that for me. When I walked into the church at 23, a very dark individual. You look past all that because people are made in the image of God. Male and female, he created them in his image. They are valuable, of eternal valuable to him. Value to him. Well, he proved that. Jesus came off his throne and died on the cross and shed his blood that we might get off the hook. No matter how dirty or how dark or how confused we are. And so this is what Peter is saying today. Christian, all of you, I told you about being submissive in different categories of life. I told you who you are in Christ, about a priest, a nation, a chosen people. I told you what God did for you. He shed his precious blood for you. He sealed you with the Holy Spirit. And he gave you a walking, talking, living hope. You don't have to walk around with your head down. This world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, guess what it is. But you're not. You have all the hope and all the joy and all the peace. You're going to eternity. So we can walk around with hope. A living hope. And that impacts people. We can let them know that we're chosen by God. That impacts people. We can show a submissive spirit in all kinds of situations. And that will impact people. And we can walk around with an attitude of Jesus Christ of humility, true love, sympathetic and compassionate and that will impact people. He says in verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. So he tells you how to be, then he tells you how not to be. In the very next verse. I mean, if you read in Peter, it's very practical. It's very clear. You don't have to be confused with what he's saying. He makes it very straightforward. And he says, not only do I want you to be a compassionate, humble, loving person, but don't be like everyone else. Everyone else is insulting each other and speaking evil with their tongue, and cutting each other down, and slandering, and gossip. Don't be like that. Don't get caught up in that. And today, I mean, in the American culture, that seems to be one of our sports of recreation. Especially online. Everyone's attacking each other online. It's a, it's a free-for-all knock your socks off, drag you down in the dirt kind of thing. And here Peter says, don't be like that. Don't trade insult for insult. Just take it. Take the strike. Take the flogging. And don't return. That's what Jesus did. Matter of fact, in two paragraphs before that, he said he was deeply insulted. He deeply suffered. They threatened him. And he did not retaliate. Okay, so there's some good advice. These are the kind of people that make an impact on you. And that's why Peter says, all of you, I want you to be like this. And I noticed, why does Peter keep giving this advice and giving this counsel? Because he wants the churches to have impact. He wants them to be a witness in their marriage, at their workplace, in their community, in their politics, and also just in general with people, to be a blessing like Jesus Christ was. He, he he made such an impact on people. Jesus wants us to be like him. I uh, was thinking about people who really impacted me in my life. And I was tracing back in my childhood. Remember the very first person that really had an impact on me? Her name was Miss Pratt. She was the mom of my best friend. And I would go over to her house to play with my friend. We would be riding bikes or eating popsicles or, you know, watching TV. And, I did, and they were a Christian family, and 
Miss Pratt and her husband were a very committed Christian couple. But they were more than just Christians. They were compassionate. They were sympathetic. They were gentle. They were kind. They were spirit-filled. That's the difference between a Christian who's not compassionate and one who is. It's the Holy Spirit. And Miss Pratt, when I was over her house, she was so kind and gentle to me. She was very patient with me. She was very nurturing, very loving. And I just noticed, wow, she is so different from everyone else, most everyone else I meet. <coughs> Why was that? Because she was living and walking and talking like Jesus. I thought of this paragraph that Peter talks about and, and bases it in the person of Jesus Christ. And I thought, have I known people like that? And I, yes, I have in my journey. I thought on this spread. I thought of other people like um, my very first youth pastor. His name was Craig. I'm not going to use last names, just first names. Pastor Craig. He was a hardcore, bare-fisted Marine. Strong as nails. Built like a mini, I don't know, rock. And uh, he used to impress all our kids by doing like 50 or 100 push-ups. Anyways, he came to know Christ. He became my youth pastor. And when I first met him, I said, there's something different about this guy. He's tough as nails, but he's so compassionate. He's so gentle. He's so loving. I mean, every time I was around him, he treated me like I was the best person in the room. And see, that's what humility is. I consider everyone around me far better than me. I am compassionate to them. I am sympathetic to them. I was a 13-year-old nobody. But my youth pastor, Craig, treated me like I was somebody. And you know what? 35, 40 years later, no, 45 years later, I still remember him. Isn't that something? Why do I remember these people? Because they act like Jesus. And Peter is encouraging us to act like Jesus, be a blessing. I think of a young couple named Frank and Penny. This was now 10 years later from 13, I'm 23. And I, I walk into church. Um, I met this girl. She invited me. I went. I wasn't born again yet. And I spent over a year in that church. And the way that people loved me and treated me just it made an impact. It, it, it changed me. It, it softened me to God and to the gospel. Especially this couple named Frank and Patty. They treated me like I was their son. It was unreal. Every time I walked into the church, they say, come sit with us. You know, and I walk, and it was a chapel like this. It was packed. Like 80 to 100 people. People were spilling out the doors. People were standing in the aisles. Because the Holy Spirit was moving. And people were loving each other. And so Jesus is like, I can use this church. So many kids from the streets got saved through that ministry. This was 1986. Anyways, I walked through the door, <laughs> hung over, strung out, looking like a wreck. And they invited me to sit with them. They talked to me, treated me with kindness. They looked past all of what I was. They looked right past it. They had me over for dinner. They took me to concerts. They took me on their family vacation day. Who does that? These people who are humble and consider others more valuable than themselves. People who love, not just in word, but in deed. People who are sympathetic to some young 20-year-old who was lost. And they were compassionate and understanding towards me. By the way, uh, Frank and Patty understood this because Frank was a drug dealer in the Bronx, New York. He and his wife, Patty, they dealt cocaine. That's how he made his living. He was a rough dude. Well, he and his wife went to a little chapel down in New York City and got saved. 
through the preaching of the gospel. They had to leave New York, and where they met me was in Tucson, Arizona, at this other little charismatic chapel, where they treated me with love and kindness. The reason they left is Frank told me the local drug dealer who he was in competition with put a hit on his life to get rid of his competition. And he, he was married with two kids. He said, Troy, I had to get my family out of that neighborhood. We weren't going to live another week. That's what he said. I gave up drugs. I got saved. We came to Tucson. And then I met them. So when I walked in the door, Frank <laughs> recognized what kind of person I was. And he said, oh, I'm going to take this kid under my wing. Frank was, I don't know, maybe 10 years older than me. I'm going to take this kid under my wing and show him the love of Jesus. And because of that, I got saved. It was all part of the equation. He goes on to say that not to repay evil for evil. This is what you were called to be sympathetic, humble, loving. This is what you were called to so that you might inherit a blessing. And what that means is I can inherit a blessing right now by being blessed by other people that I'm impacting and inherit a blessing when I go be with Jesus. He's going to look at me and say, Oh, I'm proud of you. You're like a chip off the old block. You loved people like I love people. And that was what was most important to me. He goes on to quote from Psalms. He bases this message, uh, Peter, in the Psalms. He quotes from Psalm 34. He says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Don't have an evil tongue. Don't have a dishonest tongue. They must turn from evil and do good. And they must seek peace and pursue it. I love that. That's, that's like the tip of the spear of my life. I, I've come to realize that. I most value peace. For those who know me know that. I'll tell you that up front. I most value peace. I want peace in my heart. And I want to see peace in everyone else's heart. And I want to see people be at peace with one another. And focus on loving one another and serving the King of glory, Jesus Christ. I value that above all else, peace. I'm not going to get in some type of argument or fuss or scuttlebutt or whatever of peripheral petty things. Could care less. What I care about is people loving each other and being at peace with each other and being at peace with God. That's what I value. Whatever you want to fuss about, go ahead. Spend your life fussing and spinning your wheels. I'm going to be different than that. That's what Peter is asking us. Be different than that. Don't have a tongue that's deceitful or gossiping or whatever. Seek peace. Make peace a priority. Seek peace and pursue it. Listen to what he says. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Oh. Oh. God's watching? Oh, yeah. That's what he says here. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their prayers. Now, this is the second time Peter's brought this up. In the previous paragraph to the husbands, he said, Husbands, you better be careful and treat your wives with a lot of consideration and respect because if you don't, your prayers will be hindered. And access tonight. <laughs> I want access to the throne. It's one of our greatest privileges. And now he says it again. The eyes, are on the, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. In other words, if you're living an unrighteous, ungodly, evil, deceitful life, and you're all going to God like, oh, help me out here, well, not too attentive to you. I need to see some repentance first. Now, we don't earn God's favor or earn our prayers. But what Peter has said twice now, within a single page of writing, is that it matters. You can't be this ungodly fool who treats people with anger, disrespect, and meanness and, and expect you to waltz into the throne room and say, all right, I really need this, that, and the other. Mm. 
Not, not, not hearing your prayers. Your, your prayers are hindered. That's what this says. Now, as a believer, you have access to the throne. And you can go talk to God. But what Peter is saying here is that God may not listen to you. Because you are being a dead boy and a dead girl. That's what this says. It says, it goes on to say that in his face, not only is he not attentive to your prayers when you come before him, he's talking to believers. He's talking to Christians. He says, not only that, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. See, if I became a Christian in that little church, but I wanted to keep dealing drugs because <coughs> I like getting high and I like the money, and then I still wanted to have a prayer life, it says here that the face of the Lord would have been against me for those who still do evil. I don't want the Lord's face against me. I want him to be attentive to my prayers. I don't want my prayers to be hindered. So Peter's saying you need to be a different kind of Christian. You need to live, live a different kind of life. Now, if you're thinking, well, Pastor Troy, that's not what it says, then you come and tell me what it says. And you correct me. I want to speak the word of God to God's people in a very real, truthful, face value way. And really, as I study Peter and Paul, especially Peter, it's never really that complicated. It's pretty straightforward. It's all connected. He gives scriptural references. And if you look at the original words, they, they, they mean what they say. They, they mean hindered. Your, your prayers are hindered. And, and it means I'm not attentive to what you're saying. That's what it means. And so it's important for me to communicate this to us. It goes on to say, who is going to harm you? Oh, that's the next paragraph. I'm going to do that next, next time. Now, I wanted to end with this. Because I thought through this passage, I thought through what Peter's asking. Peter's asking a lot. Um, humility, sympathy, compassion, love, controlling my tongue. Pastor, with my sin nature and my personality, that's really difficult. How do I do that? How do I do that? How do I have this special power, this, this power of God, this change of heart, this change of mind that helps me be compassionate and sympathetic all the time like Jesus. I mean, Jesus was sympathetic and compassionate and humble and loving people all the time. How do I do that all the time? Because I stumble so much. So I thought of a whole range of passages that answer that question and it caused my mind to start to explode and I thought, Troy, you can't preach a whole nother sermon to how people do that. But let me make some references. Because I ask myself the same question, Lord, how do I be this very considerate, careful husband? How do I be a good shepherd and a good Bible teacher? How do I be a good witness? How do I be the kind of Christian that makes a difference with all the people that I meet? Here's, here's the key. You know, I, I've often talked about the keys of the Christian life. They're like golden keys, platinum keys. You need to find the keys. You need to clip them on your key belt. You need to keep them there. You need to look at them. You need to hold them. You need to use them. Here's two keys. John chapter 15. Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, look, look guys, I'm leaving. I'm leaving you. But it's good that I leave. Because if I leave, I will send you an advocate who is the Holy Spirit. He will be with you, and He will be in you. And He will remind you of the things that I have said to you. And He will be the difference maker for you, in boldness and in love. And so that's the point. We can't be this on our own. I can't be compassionate and sympathetic and humble and loving on a regular basis just on Troy's M.O., on Troy's gas, on Troy's flesh. Not going to happen. Need to rely on the Holy Spirit, 
our advocate. The word advocate means he is your helper. He's alongside you. He's your helper and your strengthener. So how do we do this? By the help of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. He changes us. Makes us different. Help, helps us love people who are unlovely. Helps us to be humble and consider others more important than ourselves. Help us to be sympathetic when the person has been talking to you for 45 minutes about the problems. Can you hang in there? By the help of the Holy Spirit, you can. <laughs> uh, that was actually from John 14. Now I'm going to go into John 15. Jesus says to the disciples, this was on the last weekend he was with them before he was crucified. He says, Abide in me, and I will abide in you. You know what, I'm going to make sure I get those words right. Sometimes my memory serves me well, and sometimes it doesn't. Here's what Jesus says. <coughs> How do I do this? How do I produce this kind of fruit? Jesus tells them, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Oh, I'm attached to the vine of Jesus Christ, and the Father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While well, every branch that does bear good fruit, he prunes, so that we will even bear more fruit. What kind of fruit? Compassion, humility, love, sympathy, service, good works. The kind of fruit that God's looking for. By the way, uh, God the Father's involved. He's got his pruning shears out. <laughs> I don't know if I like that. <laughs> God the Father reaching in and slopping off some limbs. Painful. And Jesus goes on to say, listen, here's the key. You are, listen, to, he's talking to believers. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Oh, these are born again, salvation-based believers? Yeah. You're already clean because of the word I spoke to you, but remain in me. Remain in me. And I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself that must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear much fruit unless you remain in me. That is a platinum key right there. I told you a golden key about the Holy Spirit. I just give you a platinum key about Jesus Christ. Take those two and clip them on your belt and keep them there. Keep looking at them. As a Christian, you need to remain in him. A lot of Christians, we ignore him. We don't walk with him. We don't talk with him. We don't serve him. We, we go home and we have our self-absorbed life and then we land on church when it's convenient. We hear a message for 30 minutes and we go about our business. That's not remaining in Him. That's not what this says. You have to walk and talk with Him each day in prayer. Prayer is us talking to Him. And this is Him talking to you. These are all God's words on the page. That's what the Bible says. Paul says, um, all scripture is inspired and profitable for training in righteous living. Inspired, God's word. So, how do I be a strong Christian? How do I be a good pastor? I go sit down. And I talk to the throne. I don't want my prayers to be hindered, and I want him to be attentive. And I find that he is. And then I read this. It goes straight into my head, straight into my heart, straight into my soul, and comes out of my life. That's what it means to remain. Not just going to church and checking the box when it's convenient. I know, man. Troy, you're kind of you're edgy. <laughs> I grew up in the church. I grew up the son of a priest. You know what? I am not playing games. I don't want to. I saw churches that played games. It's nasty. I want to be truthful and honest, but also with compassion and grace and tell you what this says and encourage you to obey. Peter says in his, in his letter, because we will be accountable on the day that he visits us. Oh, dad's coming home? Oh yeah, dad's coming home. I want us to be good sons and daughters. I want to be a good son. And so Peter gives us, his, gives us this advice. Live your life and be a blessing. 
Uh, Father, we're grateful today that we could look at your word and see the truth of it for us as your sons and daughters in the day in which we live. You call us to account. You call us to step up. You call us to be brave, to be loving, sympathetic, and compassionate, to be a blessing. Like Jesus Christ, be a blessing to those around us. Help us do that by the Holy Spirit. Help us to walk and talk with Jesus each day that we might have that kind of power. In Jesus' name, amen.